What if human beings aren't just thinking things? What if we're less driven by what we believe and more pulled towards what we long for? Maybe human beings are fundamentally lovers, that we are made to love God, to desire God, to hunger for what God desires for his world. And I think that changes the way we think about discipleship because we'll have to start thinking about the power of habit. The things that we do are also doing something to us. Friends, again, I just want to welcome you here to Branches. If we haven't met before, my name is Colin. I'm the pastor here, and, and Carrie and I are just so grateful for your presence. I want to ask you uh, to take a moment to check in, to let us know you're here, especially if it's your first or second time here. We want to connect with you and welcome you to this community, let you know what's going on in the life of Branches, and especially like with the blessing of the backpacks. I mean, that's like a, a marking point of this fall coming where a lot of things are going on in our community, and we're so, so excited about what's going on. So if you will, take a moment to check in and let us know that you're here today. We're so, so grateful for your presence. Before uh, the sermon today, I just wanna just an offer a word of celebration just for our community. Uh, as you know, many of you may know, our first birthday as a community at Branches is we're gonna celebrate it on September 17th. And we're so, so excited about that as a community. Uh, last week, we were just overwhelmed and overjoyed with folks showing up to church uh, last Sunday. And so we were like, okay, let's put out all the chairs. And it was a good decision <laughs> because people are sitting in them, which is awesome. And so I got a Facebook memory this morning, and before we had our official launch, we had two preview services on Sunday morning just to kind of stress test the Sunday morning, like what would it be like to have worship at Branches on Sunday morning? And a year ago today was our very first uh, preview service. And so uh, we're so excited about that. I, I looked up the numbers and it was like 75 people. And then look, look at us now. So really, really exciting. So thank you for being here today. I just wanted to celebrate that. Uh, thank you guys. Yeah. Uh, and again, just wanna draw your attention to these cards. That is really important that something we do as a community is pray together, and particularly for all those students, all those faces you saw up here, and the teachers and the administrators, um, just wanna let you know that we'll, we'll be in prayer for you and, and uh, we care for you. So as we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks for this book uh, and this idea, You Are What You Love, really the center point, as you heard it on that bumper video, is uh, our desires, what we love, what we care about, is what drives us. And so we've been kind of exploring that idea. How do we assess that? Last week we talked about how really the, the end goal, what we, what we want to become as a person of love, that God is this initiating God and through God's love, we become people of love. And so that's really how we train ourselves. We all center ourselves back on this idea of a God who is love. And we talked about how love is embarrassing and sacrificial and, and self-giving. And so we want to be people like that. And that's how we identify what we love by our action, it kind of points backward to the, the center point of our heart. It's not just our ideas or our opinions or what we think, but from those, they drop down into our heart, and then it motivates us to do things. It motivates us to care for one another. It motivates us to celebrate certain things and not celebrate other things. It motivates us to be in community. It motivates us to care for students in our city and the schools around us. It motivates us, it changes what we do. As James Smith says, the things we do are doing something to us. And I think one of the, the clear places we, we find ourselves being changed and, and what we do is being changed by uh, then changing again what we do and forming us and shaping us into the people that we're supposed to become is through our families. And I'd say families like really broadly, like chosen and unchosen. Families that we put ourselves in and families that we just ended up in. This past week, I uh, celebrated my dad is his 70th birthday. Uh, so really excited for my dad's 70th birthday, and I surprised him. And, and I, when I go back to, to visit my dad and my sisters are there, we kind of fall back into the way we were when we all used to live together. Um, and some of that my dad loves, and some of that my dad does not love as much. <laughs> uh, but you're changed, we're, we're changed by the families that we're in, and it, and it motivates us. And, and on Wednesday, when I was Ubering to the airport in the morning, I met this Uber driver. Uh, and uh, he had a lot of motivations and a lot of opinions too. You know on the Uber app, you can click like, I prefer not to talk, I wish I had. <laughs> uh, and he was, I have to say, he was very, very nice, but it was 6.30 in the morning, uh, and he was a talker. 
Uh, but very, again, sincerely, very, very nice. But uh, he's from the D Dominican Republic, and I've never been there, but I've always wanted to go, so he was telling me all about it, and that was really great. And he was asking me about my, my life and what I was up to and what I did for a living, which um, I've shared this before, that can take a bad turn really quickly. Luckily, we were very chill, it was very nice. He did give me a book uh, that he wanted me to read, which is also very kind. Uh, and as long as the conversation he had with me, I mean, like, big, thick book. So, uh, <laughs> Anyway, on this Uber drive, just it got kind of quiet. It was a little awkward. I was tired. I was still kind of waking up. Uh, he said, I like my male customers. And I was like, oh, no. It's about to get weird in here. <laughs> uh, he's like, I love my male customers. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? And, and he said, well, you know, the female customers, they always find something to complain about. And they never tip me. And they never give me a good review. And he told me some stories, and like, they're never nice to me. And so that's why I like, you know, the, the male customers, they like to talk to me. I'm like, you like to talk to them, you know? <laughs> uh, and so he was telling me, and it was just on and on and on and on. It, and luckily, we were very close to the airport, but this was kind of his parting word to me. Like, he loved his male customers, female customers, not so much. Like, there must be something going on. Well, then he was telling me all about his daughter. His daughter still lives in the Dominican Republic. And uh, his, his ex-wife is there too and cares for their daughter. And then he was telling me about his daughter. He showed me a picture, so cute. And he was like, you know, and me and her mom, we don't get along. She always wants to argue with me about stuff. And she always complains. And she doesn't really like me and just on and on and on. And I just ha was like, my dude, <laughs> maybe when you have a female customer, <laughs> you're thinking about her. <laughs> Like the same complaints he had about his female customers, he had about his ex-wife. But I, you know, I'm just the passenger. I'm not going to say that sort of thing to somebody, a stranger, of course. And I'm, I didn't really have an opportunity to even say anything. Uh, but I was just like, in one of those situations where like, can you, can you not see what you're saying? Can you not see like maybe that you have this, this picture, this image of your female customers that it maybe is coming from somewhere else? Maybe you like begin with that assumption and so then you just assume that they're gonna be rude and they're gonna complain and they're not gonna give you a good review and then they're not gonna give you a tip and so you treat them poorly and then they don't give you a good review or a tip. And it just really was like kind of weighing on me after I got out of the Uber and thinking about like, I probably have those things in my own life where I have brought in this kind of, this assumption or this story I've told myself, I bring it into this situation and then it colors everything around me. Like I go into a situation and I'm grumpy or I'm, I'm antagonistic or I'm defensive and so then it colors the entire conversation. We, we create these stories, we build this like scaffolding around what's happened to us in our life and then it makes meaning in our life. We're meaning making creatures. I heard this story this week about, um, imagine if you were sitting on a park bench and a man came up to you and he said, do you know that this one species of duck, its Latin name is Histronicus Histronicus, and that's all he said and he walked away. You would have to then come up with a story about why he said that to you, and there's a few different options. Maybe he was just kind and a little weird and he just wanted to share a fun fact with a stranger on a bench. Maybe worse, maybe he was crazy and you'd feel some empathy for him and care for him that he just blurts out these things. I looked it up. This is an actual Latin name for a duck. Uh, maybe, maybe he uh, is a spy and he's giving you the code word. That one might mean you're a little crazy. Uh, <laughs> maybe he was looking up ducks in the library and he met the librarian and you really looked like the librarian and so he thought you were the librarian and so he told you that fact. See, like, and we can come up with these stories really, really quickly, and it's actually a, a really bad tendency that humans have to make up these stories way quicker than we're able to actually gather information for why somebody would behave in a certain way. I say all this to say that really that's at the root of Proverbs we're reading from today. It taps into this idea that we're meaning-making creatures that we have these things happen to us, we have life experiences, and maybe we don't have all the data, but we have enough data that we start to draw a picture around it. Well, maybe that person acted a certain way because they don't like me. Maybe the Uber driver was rude to me because of my gender. <laughs> maybe that person gave that person a gift and didn't give me a gift because they don't like me. Or maybe it was because they didn't know it was my birthday. 
we can very quickly make meaning around the data points of our lives, the data points of our life experience. And really at the foundation of Proverbs, and not just Proverbs, but all of this collection we call the wisdom literature in the Bible is this, this fact, this reality that, that we make meaning of our lives for good or for bad, right or wrong, accurate or inaccurate. It's just kind of this tendency we have. And I gotta come up with a story, a narrative, a structure around this to make it make sense. So in Ecclesiastes, you know, uh, the, the story that, that is at the root of Ecclesiastes is, you know, all, all this stuff is gonna happen to you and, and really, um, it doesn't really matter. So just eat, drink, and be merry. Enjoy yourself. That's the story you should tell yourself. The data points are random, so just enjoy it while you have it. Uh, Song of Solomon has a particular story and it's a blessing in the backpack Sunday, so that's an uh, at-home conversation. But there's a story around it. <laughs> or the Psalms even, they have some of this wisdom too. There's a path of the righteous and a path of the wicked. That's a, a story we tell to make, make sense of the data points in our lives. Then the Proverbs, and I have to say this, I have to confess, the, the Proverbs are a, a story that I really was cynical about at first, that, that it wants to be really ordered that if you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. And it's just like step by step by step, life is really ordered. And the data points, there's a reason behind them. We know from personal experience that's not always true. Like some of the worst things happen to the best people and some of the best things happen to the worst people in our estimation. But that story, that idea, that structure is at the root of the Proverbs. And so, there's one particular proverb, there's one, one piece of these kind of sayings that are attributed to King Solomon that I think really uh, strike at the heart of this idea of we are what we love and the story that we tell about ourselves. And it's just three verses in Proverbs chapter four, starting in verse 21. So just a little bit of context. Uh, the, the author, the writer, the speaker of the Proverbs is saying, pay attention to all these lessons I'm giving you. Don't let them out of your sight. So it starts in verse 21. Do not let them, these words, these sayings, out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. For the author of the Proverbs, the heart is not just the thing that pumps our blood, and it's not just the seat of our emotions, but it's the seat of our motivation. That's what we've been talking about for the past few weeks. It's the, the seat of the things that we do in the world, how we react and how we respond. And in fact, one of the binding metaphors for the heart in Proverbs is your home. The instructions that the author of the Proverbs gives to the hearer, often referred to as his children, is this is how you have a good home. And it's not just like the Western American like domestic life home, but it's like your, your center, your, your way of life, where you, where you retreat to, where you go to, where you center yourself. So it could like literally mean your house, mean your home, the place where you share time and life with your family. It could also just mean your interior home. Where is your home on the inside? When the circumstances are wild around you, and for sure the readers and hearers of the Proverbs would have lived in some crazy circumstances, the, the question of your heart, and then this uh, advice to guard your heart would be, what's happening on the inside when things are crazy on the outside? And so then he just says it straight up. This is his, his kind of conclusion in these words. Don't let these words out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. They are life. They're not just helpful for life. They are themselves life to the whole body. And above all else, guard your heart. Protect is kind of the, the connotation there. For everything you do flows from it. Notice he doesn't divide between, well, from your mind these things come, and from your body these things come, and from your spirit these, came, th these things come, but he says, from your heart all things, all things you speak and do and believe, those things come. It's this ordered way of life that the author of the Proverbs 
shares with us. And all over the Proverbs, there's very like determinative, like simple, uh, simplistic, I'd say, kind of right or wrong, black or white statements that from the heart all things flow is one of them. And so when we think about this idea of, okay, if we wanna guard our heart and if our heart is our home, our interior life, the, the center, our refuge, where we go to retreat, when the circumstances around us are wild and crazy, where we go to get away from all that, where we go on the inside to find peace and solace, how do we, how do we then, from this imperative, guard our heart? I think it's a pairing of a few different things. First, guarding your heart, protecting your heart, isn't just managing your emotions. Guarding your heart is not just telling yourself, okay, be nice. But as the author of the proverb says, it's to keep your heart in sight, to be aware of it, to look inward and be reflective and focus on what is my motivation. And when you do something that seems out of character, wonder why you did it. And when you do think something that then you're really proud of, wonder where that came from. Remember, keep it in sight. One of my, I've been spending all this past week with my family, I'm reminded of the kind of sayings that my family would say over and over again. One of which is remember who you are, which in my mind was either a an encouragement, like before I went off to college, my dad telling me, remember who you are, and then also words given when punishment was given. <laughs> that when I did something wrong, or when I stepped out of line, or I said something I shouldn't have, my dad would say, and even just imagining the voice is terrifying, remember who you are. Like, this ain't you. <laughs> this isn't who you're supposed to be. And I think also carried with it, like, you know, we're Bagby's, Bagby's don't do this and that. And a teenage column would say, well, this Bagby does, you know, like <laughs> defiant. <laughs> that was my home, that was my refuge, that was my heart. And now I look back on it and I, and I know what my dad was saying and I, and I know why he got that from my grandmother. That it wasn't just to say like, all right, this is this list of things that we do, but we love, we desire, we center our home, our family, our hearts around these values, really. That's what it means to guard your heart, is to remember. At the same time, guarding your heart is not isolationist. Sometimes people quote this proverb when they talk this proverb when they talk about romantic relationships. It's like, okay, guard your heart. Uh, don't talk to boys, you know. Uh, don't don't um, you know do things that you shouldn't do. Don't don't you know get mixed up with somebody that really doesn't share your same values. And maybe you could apply that in some capacity. But it's not it's not about isolation. It's not about cutting yourself off. In fact, I think guarding your heart in the mind of the Proverbs and also through the whole Bible to guard your heart is to give it away to more people. That you guard the love that God gives you by multiplying it that you guard your love, not by being as we're kind of taught to implicitly, to set ourselves aside and go it alone and do things alone, but to be in community. And we guard our hearts collectively as a people, as a community, as a church. You don't guard your heart alone. And it's not defensive either. Guarding your heart is not like, okay, and at every moment I'm gonna walk on eggshells around my emotions, about my desires, about what I want, about what I love. It's not defensive, but again, it's about reminding ourselves about who God says we are. Uh, we learned the word liturgy last week, if it was unfamiliar to you, so we'll just like pile it on. Here's another church word we can learn together, is this word catechesis. Any, any Roman Catholics in the house know catechesis. And I, there's one thing I wish the Methodist family had more of, and we do have some of it, but it's not as serious in our Catholic friends' uh, lives, it's more serious in some Presbyterian churches. Catechesis is the ordered way of learning the Christian faith. And it's usually by these premises that you either raise a question or you say something just straight out about who God is, the way the world is, the state of humanity, who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and it's kind of step by step through the whole story of scripture. It's kind of rehearsing the story. I had a professor, Tom Long, who he was in a small Presbyterian church growing up, and uh, they would do catechesis in Sunday school. And he would ask the question and then the children would give the response. And the first question, and again, like I remember my dad saying, remember who you are, encouraging or not so encouraging, uh, is the first question was, who made you? And I can't remember her name, but he said his Sunday school teacher was like the meanest woman in the world. <laughs> and so who made you was like with a, a pointed, direct, sharp finger and a scowl on her face. And he would, she would say, who made you? And he would say, the almighty God made me. 
and then they would go down the list and each question pointing, pointing. And I'm not saying that she did the right thing, but Dr. Long always talked about how in moments where he forgot who he was, where his motivations were stirred, where he didn't know how, quite how to ground himself, he would see his teacher's face and he would remember the response to the question, who made you? The Almighty God made me. And from there, all things flow. As the author of the Proverbs says, from the heart, from the center, from the home that the, the Almighty God made me, all things flow. And it, then it wasn't just an opinion, it became his story, it became his whole life, it became the whole script for his motivation, for who he wanted to be, for who he wanted his kids to be, for how he wanted his community to be. Because he knew it wasn't just about what he thought or really about what he wanted to achieve, but it was about his heart. And so he guarded it by remembering. He guarded it by doing so in community. He guarded that truth, that center, that heart by recalling it and bringing it up and rehearsing it. Because from the heart, all things flow. Where's the place that you go that you feel most secure? In, in your interior life, is it a memory? And in your interior life, is it a prayer or a song? Is it a poem? Is it a face? Is it a person? In, in your own life, where's that, that center that you can, you can find solace if you've had a bad day? Is it a chair, a specific chair? Is it a specific time at night? Is it a meal? Is it a friend? Is it a phone call that you can make? What is that place from which all of your motivation flows? Where is that place where you can find yourself and center yourself and remind yourself, as Dr. Long did, who made me? Who am I? Remember who you are. Why am I here? What is this all about? Where is that center? Uh, this past week, again, spending time with my family, you know, I have a, a twin sister and an older sister. There's just like some moments where all of a sudden, we're mischievous 12 and 17 year olds again. <laughs> and we're telling the same jokes and we're poking fun at our dad and we're growing up together and learning one another and there's this ease in which I don't see them all the time and then we're together and we're back home. Not because I live in or will live in Durham, North Carolina, but because they were there. Because I'm reminded again of where I came from and who I am and then from there, all things flow. I think where we can ultimately point, where we can, where we can then shift all of our attention and we draw this, this idea of this scaffolding, this home, this center of our lives, this place from which all of our motivation flows is uh, of course to point it back to Jesus. Another really cool thing about the Proverbs is there's this character uh, in the Proverbs named Wisdom and it's with a capital W in the English translation, that, and wisdom speaks. Wisdom says, I was with God in the beginning and I helped create the world, this wisdom. These words that Solomon is sharing have this personified voice and way of life and features that you can kind of pan out as you read through the Proverbs. And we, we trace that idea that this wisdom was with God from the beginning and, and it kind of has this personal feel to it. Christians have wanted to say for centuries, those words, even as John 1 says, became flesh. The wisdom of God was a person. The advice God gave wasn't at a distance on a piece of paper, wasn't catechesis even, <laughs> but was embodied. And that same embodied person, that same body, that same wisdom in the flesh gave himself, not by teaching and preaching only, but by washing feet and setting a table and giving of himself fully, even unto death. For people that follow Jesus, if it's your family and your house and a poem and a song, the ultimate one, the, the first center, the one place we draw ourselves back to over and over and over again is this one who is wisdom. One who, when he speaks, says, cuts to the heart, exactly what we need and exactly where we are and exactly where we need to go. Embodies for us what it means to live a wise and expert living life. Shows us the way of the righteous and shows us the way of the wicked and which one to go. Shows us be be before us 
what it means to live a life that reflects into the world people whose hearts are just burst open in love for the world. We think about all the ways that we tell these stories about these data points in our life and the, the ways that we, we make up stories around them to make sense of the world. I wanna just challenge us and put forth maybe just a statement that maybe the most compelling story, maybe the one that makes the most sense, maybe the one that's easiest to share and also at the same time the hardest to share, maybe the one that can make sense of all the data points better than any of the other ones is this person, Jesus. The one who teaches us to know what it is to love. The one who teaches us to know that, that whatever we love shapes and forms who we are and what we believe and what we do and then likewise shapes us into people who are more like him. Just wrestle with the idea, come in contact with the one who is wisdom and invites you to live wise and righteous lives, not on your own, not in isolation, not by managing your emotions, but by giving yourself fully to him. I invite you to do that. Let's pray. Almighty God, on this morning, we remember that you made us, that you are for us, that you are with us, and that your stories become our story. The data points of our lives can be drawn around with the shape of who you are. And we ask that you would make us more mindful in every moment of your presence with us, of your guiding hand and voice, and most of all, that in yourself, you gave us one who is the most wise, who gives us the best advice, who shapes our best emotions and our best motivations, one who is love in Jesus Christ. We ask that in this moment and when we come to this table, that we would experience you and remember that, not just in our mind, but deep in our heart. Ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.